do. Vivek, it's good great to see job. You, good Thank to you. see you. Thank um, you. I will tell you, I've been here since, uh, geez, 7 o'clock this morning, and uh, the, the, uh, the political talks have just gotten better and better. I think you did a really great job. Thank you. Um, uh, again, we look at, we look at you, um, and you said some really difficult things to this crowd. Um, you talked about the war, and you're the first one, I think, that has been very clear on not my child, mm -hmm. not your child, going to fight. You said, we just don't do it. Mm -hmm. How realistic is that? I think it's very realistic, Glenn. And the fact is that there's an opportunity. I'm a big fan of using silver linings, even of bad decisions that have been previously made. I think most of the aid we've put into Ukraine, all of it, has been a bad choice. But here's what we can get out of Hold it. Hold on just a sec. Do you think it's a bad choice, or do you think... I, I think that, I, that we're not watching that money. I oh. think that's a money laundering situation. Oh, it is. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Oh, no doubt about it. Okay. I mean, I think I have my own views on Zelensky, and we can, we, yeah. can, we can go down that rabbit hole. Right. But I care more about this country than just pointing out that sure, problem, sure, sure, but we sure. could spend hours on that. Yeah. My, my point is we can use this as an opportunity to accomplish a different and a more important strategic objective for the U.S., which is break apart the Russia-China alliance. Yes. That is what nobody's talking about. The top crowning achievement of the next president of the United States will be to disrupt that alliance. And now Ukraine gives us a chance to do it. So we do a deal that gives Putin the things that most Republicans and nearly all Democrats are unwilling to do, freeze the current lines, commit that NATO will never admit Ukraine, not some path to joining, never admit Ukraine. But in return, Putin has to exit his military partnership with China. We'll then reopen up economic relations with Russia. I think that's okay. I think that's a good thing. Then Putin has no reason to be Xi Jinping's little brother. Right. Which, by the way, deters China from going after Taiwan. Right. Because China's bet now is that they don't, the U.S. won't want to be at odds with two different nuclear allied superpowers. Correct. But if Russia's not in China's camp, now we have actually deterred China from going after Taiwan without going to war. Think about just the just the expansive nature of a simple foreign policy vision that nobody in either party is talking about. That's what I think we should be talking you about. You said today that um, on stage that you don't have a lot of experience. You don't have any experience, in, experience running uh, governments, et cetera, et cetera. Is that really necessary in today's world to have the experience? Is it? Is it honestly that different than running the world's largest corporation and reining it in and getting it right? I think it is. I think the fact that it is different is a good thing. Because I think that one of the things that happens when you actually go through this totem pole and ladder of government is that you become acclimated to its ways. So I'm coming in with a clear sighted view, Glenn, of shutting down most of the administrative state. How realistic is that? Very realistic. So first of all, do it on strong legal authority. So I'm a unique combination. I don't like to brag a lot, but I'm a CEO, but I've also studied the Constitution deeply. And the Supreme Court right now shares my view of the Constitution. The U.S. president already has statutory authority. The Presidential Reorganization Act of 1977 says you can shut down redundant agencies. Well, when I look at what the DEA does and what the U.S. Marshals do, there's my legal justification for shutting down the FBI without asking Congress for permission or forgiveness. Jeez. You know, there's another justification, stimulating the economy, also in that same statute. The $80 billion spent in the U.S. Department of Education, you don't know what? That would stimulate the economy to give it back to the people. That's my legal justification. So I understand the legal footing. By the way, what stopped Trump? The civil service protections, they said. Correct. Well, guess what? Read the law. Civil service protections protect against the individual firings of employees for supposedly political reasons. They do not apply to mass layoffs. And mass layoffs are absolutely what I'm bringing to Washington, D.C. Would you lay it off, reform it, or close it down, these institutions? M many agencies, I would just shut down the agencies. There's a certain list of other agencies where we have 75% headcount reduction plans. Jeez. And then there are other agencies which we move out of Washington, D.C., make people move. Many of them will volunteer not to. We save on the severance costs. Who's your favorite president of the 20th century? Of the 20th century? Ronald Reagan. 
Round ranking. Yeah, no doubt. You about should it. read his favorite was Calvin Coolidge, and what oh, you good. just suggested was Calvin Coolidge. This is this is actually this is vintage Coolidge. Coolidge is maybe he was that's probably the only guy who was born on July Fourth. Yeah, so he's a true American <laughs> yeah. Independence birthday yeah. man. Um, that's part of why. Uh, when you heard uh, Kamala Harris, and nobody's talked about this, and I I believe, and I think you probably do too, the biggest issue of our day is very soon going to be artificial uh, artificial, artificial intelligence. intelligence. It is. When you heard our vice president say, AI <laughs> is a very fancy word, it's two letters for two words. Yeah. And the thing she says afterwards is it's basically it's machine wrong. learning is wrong. It's wrong. Like ML and AI, is so, oh. so let's, let's put aside the technical yeah, features it. of one woman's cognitive yeah. deficits, which would be too- She's a first grader. It's too small for us to waste yeah. time even talking right. about, right? Yeah. When you think about AI, so I have a clear vision on this. I think that outright bans are dangerous because yes. we will adopt constraints that China will not adopt. Correct. We've done that before. Gain of function research gets what happens. It comes yeah. back and harms us. And we and do we it in fight. black ops. And we do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we funded that, by the way. Yep. So outright bans aren't the way to go. We don't have a ton of time, Glenn, but what I'll give you is the framework. And I'm the only candidate talking about this is we have to create a framework of strict liability for the developers of any AI protocol for the consequences, including unintended consequences, of developing that protocol. So that gets the government out of the way, and it forces a company to be able to internalize the risk-benefit on their own. Microsoft, Meta, they're dead set opposed to this, right? Because they're in a race to achieve what you try to do in the tech world, create a moat, invest heavily before others are able to catch up. But if they have to take into account and be liable for the unintended consequences of what they create, they will have to internalize that in what they do. And the second constraint is protecting children. Children complete stop interface of AI's interface with children Thank in God. ways that are pragmatic. Yep. So that's a general framework for me for how to handle this. You are a uh, uh, former tech biotech yes. uh, CEO. When you look at the Department of Defense, the biggest uh, benefactors of the budget from the Department of Defense, five out of the top ten are big pharma. Amazing. Why is that? And why do you think that's dangerous? It's cronyism. Or do you? It's cronyism. Absolutely. I mean, the merger of state power and private power, especially defense at that, to do through the back door what government couldn't do through the front door, this is crony capitalism at its worst. And so I think the big pharma is... An industry, and I know this better than, than most, Glenn, I spent my entire career standing up to Big Pharma. It created a lot of inefficiencies that allowed me to build a successful company that called their bluff. But for our country, it is a tightly regulated industry, but it is also an industry that is government, run by government, create a monopoly. Yes. And that creates an industry that behaves like a government itself. So the first thing I would do is, let's say we roll back some of those croniest privileges. Why are vaccine manufacturers specially exempt Correct. from liability when any other manufacturer bears Correct. product liability? That's just crony capitalism. And so I do think it takes somebody, whether it's on AI, whether it's on big pharma, that has some understanding of the actual substance Correct. rather than taking it from an advisor managerial class, most yeah. of whom are captured by professional lobbyists on behalf of you know, big pharma to BlackRock to Silicon Valley. They understand how to capture the managerial class, but they cannot capture a president who has a deep first personal understanding of the Constitution and of the issues, including as they relate to technology. That's part of what motivates me to say that, you know what, this is why we're making the sacrifices to actually see this all the way through. Not in this just to make a point. I think it's going to take someone from the outside, but with that level of understanding, to address an era where the threats aren't as simple as they were in 1980. They're more complicated today. Were you at all concerned, or are you at all concerned, um, about um, the acceptance of a Hindu as the president of the United States? I say this yeah, as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ, yeah. <laughs> so that's not Christian enough for a lot of Christians. Have we passed that? You or know, I think it depends on the person, right? I mean, whether you're a Christian or whether you're a diff person of a different faith. I understand this is a nation founded on Judeo-Christian values. And Glenn, I think I can say this with deep, honest conviction here. I share those same Judeo-Christian values more so than even many self-professed Christians across the country. I agree with that. And I also think that because I'm such a staunch defender of those shared values, nobody's going to accuse me of being a Christian nationalist as I do it. So <laughs> it's, it's actually true, though, because people feel there's almost a compunction right. that people yeah. feel, right? So it almost puts me at greater liberty 
than a Mike Pence or somebody else who's going to be labeled and put into some retrofitted box. I'm making faith and family and individual hard work and nation. I'm making these values cool again for the next generation, actually. I think these are cool. Yeah. But my job is to actually reach that next generation with bringing those values and making them the values of progress for young people. And I think I can do that better because I'm younger, because my parents were immigrants to this country. No one's going to call me xenophobic or racist, not yeah. as easily at least. And yes, part of it is, yes, I'm a person of faith, but not raised in a tradition Christian household. I do have the benefit of having read the Bible <laughs> thoroughly. I went to Catholic, Catholic high school. school. Yep, absolutely. And I never felt like I was reading the Bible for the first time. Yeah. And I think that a lot of these are deep-seated in the tradition that I was raised in. Sacrifice, duty, the idea the that God put us here for a reason. The true principles of America. The true yes. principles. Not the flag. The true principles. Yes. Are Judeo-Christian. Yes, they and are. And so if you know this, you know the principles of the gospel. And we share those values yeah. in common. So I don't think that would be necessarily possible for an atheist, Glenn. I think that would be yeah, a be, difficult bridge. And, I, right. and my answer to your question would be no. But for somebody who believes in a single God and that we are one nation under God and who is raised in a household deeply with those values, but still having some of the latitude to drive this change in our culture, I actually think I may be best positioned to revive those Judeo-Christian shared values in our next generation. You have yeah. a very bright future. Thank you, Glenn. It's Thank good you to very see you. much. Good, good to see you. See you. Yeah, Thank good to you. Here. And Thank you for everything you're doing on ESG and, I appreciate it. and saving our nation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Glenn. You.